What I'm doing today is essentially, uh, I'm going to do a very Canadian thing, as the token Canadian, I think, in the room, and I'm going to apologize. How do you get 100 Canadians, drunken Canadians, out of a swimming pool? Say, please get out of the pool. Okay, we're, we're well known to be very polite, maybe I'm not, but um, what I'm doing today is presenting to you a, an older paper that's been under review for a little bit of time, so it's not preliminary, it's fairly well honed. I would really appreciate comments to whatever extent I get, can hopefully constructive and not too much destructive commentary on this. Um, but this essentially comes from uh, a student of mine a couple years ago, Russell Lawrence, who's currently at Cargill, uh, and don't let that make you think he's pro-shipper or pro-farmer. Uh, Russell's a scoundrel, actually, in that way. He, uh, he's pretty mean to farmers, actually. What we did, um, we're, we're building a model here. This is very much pie in the sky. So the issue is, in the sort of contestability of regulatory literature, you ask yourself, okay, the Europeans have open access. Most of them have open access in rail. I understand Britain's reconsidering some of that. Australia has open access with some glitches. Um, so we said to ourselves, rather than you know, just kind of pie in the sky talking at a market level 30,000 foot perspective about contestability and, and trying to get some competition injected into the system, let's simulate it. Let's run a model that does this and let's see what we get. Uh, and my results here are pretty basic actually. I'll go through a few things to give you sort of background on where the situation is. But the devil's always in the details and I'm fully cognizant of that. And of course, uh, Fernando's paper earlier this morning was a general equilibrium model. This is very, very similar to that in that there are lots of assumptions built in. There are lots of little bits and pieces of computational code that go into this. I'm gonna try to simplify that down to something very, very straightforward. In fact, I have a flow chart, which is probably unreadable, but that kind of describes the whole model. Um, and what we've done here is, as I said, we've taken, I don't think the laser works, We've decided to take the Canadian Grain Handling and Transportation System. And for those of you who don't know or have forgotten, uh, the Canadian uh, rail system is essentially deregulated except for grain. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about that as we go through. And effectively, we've had a bunch of reviews over the past few years. Currently, most of you probably know, there was one put out just recently, December 2015, which I actually haven't had a chance to fully read yet although I've read SR 318, oddly enough. Anyway, the Canadian report I haven't read yet all the way through, but it basically talks about sort of revamping Canadian transportation. We do this every five to 10 years um, with a particular focus in chapter eight on the Canadian grain handling system because there are controversies, of course, the most recent one coming with uh, what we call the perfect storm of 2013-14 with the bumper crop, with cold weather, with oil movements in the Bakken and from, uh, from Alberta. Uh, there are all kinds of issues around moving things and I'll tell you a bit about the regulations that came about because of that, okay? All right, so, and again, the apology is it's a slightly older paper. Uh, it's pretty close to publishable format right now, but I really would appreciate if anybody has any general comments or specific comments about what we're doing here. So, so there's the overview. Now, I realize that I'll describe that. For those of you who don't know, I'll describe that. I'm sure most of you don't know that. Uh, a little bit of model description. And the, the bugaboo of access. And let me just say right up front, and I've told a few of you here, in no way was this an attempt to promote access. It was an attempt to study under what conditions access may occur only within the grain handling system. We did not consider other commodities. So again, you're gonna see the scope of the study is pretty extensive, but we had to limit it down to that one commodity to make it you know, even more tractable, I guess, in some sense, okay? Okay, so we're developing this agent-based simulation of the Western Canadian Grain Handling and Transportation System. So we're going to effectively, we're going to do a sim city, sim rail. We're going to run and try to perform and try to validate and verify a model of the Canadian Grain Handling System deliveries. And you can imagine it's a whole supply chain analysis, and we'll go through that a little bit. Um, we're, going to we're going to measure some inefficiency. So what Russell and I kind of decided was that rather than access being something where uh, you know, what excuse would the shipper have, the grain shipper have to call for access? In this model, the grain shipper has to be able to say to the agency, we have the Canadian Transportation Agency, the equivalent of the STB, would have to be able to say to the agency, I've got grain sitting on a siding that's not moving. Can someone please move it for me? And that's the conditions under which we sort of drew the access provision. And I'm gonna show you how often that occurs in the simulation, it doesn't occur, that doesn't occur that often, but of course, the data is a bit older here, so things may have changed a little bit, and we can certainly talk about that. And again, determine if this possibility exists and under what conditions you could get viable entry. And by viable, I mean 
and an access fee that's compensatory to the railway that will basically sustain the whole system. What kind of rate structure can you sustain based on entry okay, by this third party railway? Um, funny point here, the reviewer of this paper, some of whom may be in the room, uh, the review, one of the reviewers actually said, well, who's going to enter? It's going to be CN or CP, one of the two major railways. Well, we envision it would be a third party railway, maybe a new railway, an Omnitrax. Uh, in fact, many of you know now what's happened in Canada is the interswitching provisions, which are, are now changed, and we can talk about those later. What's happened is they're just long enough in certain places, certainly in southern Alberta, that guess who's entering into Canada to, take, to, to get traffic? It's Burlington Northern, right? So, we, But we envision certainly that it wouldn't be BN or anybody else coming in. It would be a third-party railway coming in here who would actually notice these opportunities and seize upon them, basically. Okay? All right. Let's make sure this works. Um, unfortunately, I don't have an updated elevator map. It's actually, uh, I have an updated one from this. Basically, like the US system, we still have, we're not a bunch of co-ops in Canada. We have, and this is really an interesting point about the supply chain, we have essentially six major grain companies in Canada. Um, one of them will soon be Bungie, who's just entering the market. So obviously there's some money to be made there. But basically, like you, we've had a fair amount of abandonment. So if we look, this is, how many people can actually say that word? Probably not many. Saskatchewan, <laughs> everybody gets it wrong. Um, I'm not from there, by the way, so I did too. So, so back in, two, in 1999, before the, the, the old, well, I'll call them the current set of regulations that are in place, we had 1,004 elevators, and of course, abandonment had to occur. I mean, this was not very efficient. Many of these elevators were quite small, you know, under, under 1,000 tons of storage, so there's a huge amount of abandonment. And what we see here is that back in 2008, and this is... If any of you know who the Quorum Corporation is, Canadian regulations are about as layered and convoluted as US ones. Quorum Corporation is a private company out of Edmonton who basically is the grain monitor. What they do, they gather a bunch of data on happenings in the system. So they put a lot of these maps together. So as of 2008, and this is about fits the data that we have for the particular study, so the data we have is a little older, we have 370 elevators now. I'm going to narrow this down even further for the study we're going to see. I'm just going to pick Saskatchewan because it makes sense. Saskatchewan of the, let's say, on average, I don't know, 13 to 18, on average, 13 to 18 million tons of grain that gets exported out of Vancouver, about 65 to 70% comes from Saskatchewan. So the middle province there, the, the kind of stretched out rectangle where I'm from, is the most important sort of grain delivery province in Canada. So we're going to focus on that. Uh, meaning that we left out southern Alberta and southern Manitoba out of the study. And again, that was for tractability. Okay? So, but we're capturing a fair chunk of the market. As of today, by the way, and I'll say this later, uh, there are currently about 142, I think it is, elevators across Western Canada. Don't quote me on that. In Saskatchewan, there are probably about anywhere between 80 and 90 elevators in Saskatchewan. Of course, they've gotten a lot larger. Uh, there's a lot more rail sightings. A lot of this investment has occurred that we talked about earlier. Okay, so to talk about the regulatory system, and some of you probably already know this, since the 2001 crop year, freight rates per ton, there's a reason I'm going to talk about this, it'll come later. Freight rates per ton for export bound grain have been basically under this system called the maximum revenue entitlement or the revenue cap. It's not a true revenue cap, it's a sliding scale piece of regulation. Basically, it says that railway, if you have, if you have this average length of haul and you have um, you know, this much, uh, what, what's other factors, and I haven't got it written up here, there are several factors that go in the calculation that are rail specific. It actually spits out a number from a formula that says, okay, CN, you can earn $600 million this year on grain revenues, and the grains are so defined in the act. CP, you can make X amount per year on grain. Um, now, that's regulation if there was one, right? Uh, anyway, the, but it's been very controversial, and we'll get back to this later. It's called the rev cap. The cap applies to the so-called six major grains that are grown in the West, wheat, particular barley, canola, oats, rye, and flax. Um, the grain share of total rail revenues remains stable for both railways. So roughly the railways and CN's a bit less than CP. CP earns about 20 odd percent of their total revenue on, on grain. CN probably a little less, maybe anywhere from eight, 15 to 17 percent, and that number probably fluctuates a bit. So this is a fair chunk of their business, okay? And they operate within this regulatory structure and trying to maintain and try to decide how their supply chain is going to work, et cetera, et cetera. Recent controversies you probably heard, railways have exceeded the MRE, and if they do, they get punished. Uh, one year, 
There were a bunch of reasons why it happened, but the railways collectively paid, oh gosh, it must have been about $70 million in penalties. It wasn't trivial. Um, the key thing here, and I can't use the pointer, removal of the Canadian Wheat Board. So for many years, the Canadian Wheat Board, certainly through the era that this study has occurred, our particular study, the Wheat Board had governed logistics in the grain handling system. So the Wheat Board, essentially, the grain companies were kind of secondary players in the system. The Wheat Board would negotiate and work out with the railways car allocations to figure out how things were done. They're gone now. August 2012, the Conservative government, which is now out because now we have beautiful Justin in power. I'm kidding. <laughs> he's he's left-wing liberal. He just looks good. Uh, Justin, uh, Justin's not responsible for this. This is the prior government. They got rid of the Wheat Board. And of course, we, so that has changed. And actually, that's still evolving. There's still a whole sort of, you know, you can think of what are shocks to systems. Well, that's been a shock to the system. We'll talk about that. And of course, on top of that, you know, a year and a half later, we had the bumper crop. And we had additional regulations that occurred. Let me mention what those were quickly. There were two things essentially that came out of that. One was for a period of, and again, don't quote me on this, for six months, the government said, railways, you're going to move 5,000 cars a week of grain because there was a backlog. Uh, and again, don't quote me on the exact, I think it was 5,000 per railway. Uh, base, and the other regulation that came in was the, uh, reg, was the uh, reciprocal switching. Our version of it's called the extended inner switching is reciprocal switching. Those radii bumped up from 30 kilometers to 160 kilometers. Okay, so the two of them came in together. The backlog was moved out. The railways said it was obviously a combination of weather, oil, a whole bunch of stuff. So things were going on. So I guess what I'm getting at here is, and we'll compare some of these things later on, rates in Canada for grain are regulated. Okay, they're regulated not directly due to, uh, due to kind of a, a subsidy format. They're regulated by this revenue cap. So I just want you to keep that in mind as you're looking at some of the results we get. And secondly, that we're undergoing very, very similar transformational stuff in rail as you guys are down here. So it's, it's all very much in flux at this point. So again, the purpose of the particular study that we did before all this occurred was to say exactly what will access occur in this very controversial sector of the industry can it occur under what conditions, all right? So industry overview, I'll skip over this. I don't have more recent, but you know, if you look at later dates here, it doesn't change very much. This is up to 2010. And again, telling the same story I had before of how much, how much of total revenue of each Canadian railway was in fact uh, part of uh, grain movement. Uh, I just wanted to pull this up. And this is not to attack CP, but you know, and again, there are issues that come on here. We, we, talk, about, uh, we talk about market failure. We talk about market power. Uh, this is an interesting quote I found a few days ago from the CP annual report that I decided to put in. And if you read it, and I won't read it out loud, I'll let you have a look at it. I think the font's big enough to read from where you are. Whatever happened to common carrier obligation, right? How are we going to deal with this? So these are issues that aren't going to come up in our particular study. I was just very interested to see that the railways at this point, certainly one could attribute this potentially to Hunter Harrison, knowing what he's like. Um, they want to make money. Of course they want to make money. But again, we have common carrier law, which is supposed to kind of counteract that. Anyway, so that's just something I found that I thought was kind of interesting for this audience. And certainly, if you want to chat about that, I will. OK, so the current situation is this reciprocal switching, the perfect storm I mentioned. The process is ongoing, but railways claim CP, for example, has said if inner switching rules, which are being used, by the way, no matter what you've heard, uh, my talking to various shippers around Western Canada, the inner switching rules are being used. They're not necessarily being enacted. They're being used as a competitive lever against the railway, whatever you're dealing with, to try to negotiate a lower rate. CP claims they're going to lose $13 million in foregone revenue. Um, again, I'm not sure where the number came from, but they're just giving you sort of a sense of how much is at play here. The CTA review of 2015. So this is the latest report that came out. Um, uh, basically that said we should sunset inner switching and the maximum revenue entitlement should go. So inner switching is supposed to stop this August. The maximum revenue entitlement is supposed to be changed somewhat, modified, and then removed after seven years. Okay? And again, what's happening right now is there is debate among various grain shippers as to which regulatory policy they kind of want to sit behind. So you have a bunch of folks who say, I think inner switching is the way to go because it introduces competition. You have other folks saying, hey, the MREs work pretty well. We want to keep that. Uh, so again, we're still oh, different issues than you folks have to do, but it is, it's a bit of a bifurcation going on here now in Canada, just to get you up to date. OK, agent-based economic simulation. I guess I could ask a question, how many in the room have ever heard of this? There's probably a handful of you who have. There's a partial reason for that. Um, Agent-based models, which are essentially uh, really, really micro-level models. So if you think of 
general equilibrium models that occurred this morning were on a, a kind of a regional or a, a sort of a local type level. These get down essentially to the individual level, okay? You model, and there are software packages that help you do this. We use one particular package called NetLogo, which is actually freeware. NetLogo is nice because it's fairly easy to code. Uh, it's also compatible with GIS, so you can actually import a map of some place and actually do your analysis based on the map. Um, at the time that Russell did this, the GIS compatibility only built up, so it's been much easier to use lately than it was when he did this. So what you do is you discretize individuals as agents, okay? Uh, agents who are independent, who are heterogeneous, who are, have some goal orientation, basically, okay? Now, they, but the key here is, compared to general equilibrium models, is they interact with other agents, okay? And this is usually a spatial or local effect. So, for example, in the model here, if I'm a farmer and I have grain I want to deliver to the elevator, and I find out that I can't deliver the grain to the elevator, I have to pull it back and wait for the, the system to kind of go around again. So there's some dynamism, there's feedback in these systems, okay? They're, the individuals are programmed typically to be, again, goal-directed, so what do the farmers want to do? They want to maximize their, their throughput, essentially, in the model, their, 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 uh, the amount of grain they put in the system. They're adaptable, they're, they're, they're programmed to stop if they can't deliver the grain, pull it back and move it somewhere else. Uh, and they're autonomous, okay? As opposed to a GE model where all the equations are kind of pre-programmed in, the way agent-based models work based on object-oriented programming, the objects are allowed to change over time, okay? So there's a little bit of difference between them. So the reason you probably haven't heard of it is because, first of all, McCall and North are actually computer scientists out of Northwestern who, in fact, uh, developed a whole software package called Repast, which we've used a little bit. But David Colander, and I don't know if you know David Colander, he's written a good, couple of good intro micro textbooks. He's essentially a libertarian, Hayekian, uh, Austrian economist. He's come out and basically said, this is the kind of modeling that we should use now to formulate economic policy. We need to use agent-based modeling rather than general equilibrium modeling to formulate policy because you say, give individuals objectives at the ground level and let that emerge. Let the, let the macro level output or effects of that, consequences of that emerge, okay? So I guess why I'm telling you this is we're a little ahead of the curve. Um, this modeling is very popular in biology. There's some work in supply chain management. Very little in economics. Uh, there's a fellow, um, I can't remember, Herb Gintis, and another couple of folks who do this stuff kind of on the side of what they do with their stuff, but it still hasn't gained complete acceptance in economics, um, partially because it is truly a full-blown simulation type analysis, okay? Uh, and what I'm saying now is that hopefully in the next couple of years, three to five years, we'll get more people thinking about using it because it's gaining further acceptance in the broader profession. Okay, so what this consists of basically are layers, just I'll go through this quickly. We have layers of information, we have landscape, we have yields, we have trucking distances, we have elevator locations. We have all these layers built into it. So what that does effectively, you want to think about, that creates for each individual in the simulation, I'll tell you who those are in a second, everybody is is heterogeneous. There is some degree of homogeneity amongst the individuals, but most of them, there is also some degree of heterogeneity. They're slightly different. So for example, in the province of Saskatchewan, and I know this is true in Montana, North Dakota, we have soil regions which are a little bit different on the yield side. So we've managed to build that in. So we have output that comes out every year from a farm which differs across these agricultural regions, okay? So that's a degree of, of heterogeneity, okay? Everybody's located different distances from the elevator, okay? The locations are, are different depending where you're doing things. Uh, so there are all kinds of differences that are built into this, all right? <clears throat> so here's the scope and parameters. Now, again, stepping back. This is a big model. It's a big model of a small region you've never been to, <laughs> okay? It's not that small in, it is, well, it's somewhat small in world grain markets, but it's, it's not small to the Canadian sector. But again, this is thousands of lines of code. And this is one of the parables I usually tell people when I do this, is that Russell was a master's student. This is really PhD level work. This is a lot of coding. This is a lot of work. Um, it gets very difficult to do. So any of you policy folks out there want to get into this, it does take time to do it. But the results, as you're going to see, I think are worth it. They're interesting. They're defensible. Uh, and you, you get some really interesting economic things come out of it, many of which I can't talk about today. So, what agents do we have? 25,422 farms. 
Okay, so each one of those farms is different. They're either in a different location, which is the first thing they're different. They may have slightly different objective functions, so there's differences among the farmers. At this point, we put 157 primary elevators. So, grain supply chain. I am farmer, I grow grain, I harvest grain, I collect grain, I put grain in truck, I move truck to local elevator, I unload grain there. Or I store on farm, one or the other. From the elevator, train picks up grain, train moves grain off to, well, in this case, Vancouver. Uh, sometimes it goes east towards uh, the Great Lakes, et cetera. But again, so we have elevators in there, and they all have objective functions. They're trying to maximize their throughput and their profit. We have the two Canadian Class 1 railways in this. That's all we've got. And of course, the third party entrant. And we have monthly decisions recorded for 30 years. So we basically have sort of validated data over 30 years. And of course, we replicated it. Anytime you do a simulation analysis, you can't run it once. We run it a 1,000 plus times to get this. And the problem with these models is they take a long time to run. So it took Russell a couple of months just to get basically his base run once we got this thing set up, okay? Okay, so the input data, a bunch of things you can find in the paper, just a summary here. We have the rail rates that are actually paid for delivery from each delivery point to port. We have elevator capacities, tariffs, grain prices, and grain production by subregion, which I mentioned to you earlier. There are essentially 20 what we call census agricultural regions in Saskatchewan. Each one has a slightly different yield level. So if I'm farming in car 1A in southeastern Saskatchewan and I put the same inputs in, my output yield's gonna be a little bit different from the guy who's over in car 8B who's in better soil. Okay, so that's another source of heterogeneity. Okay, so what do we got here? Um, so there's the flow chart. Now again, I apologize for the small font, but the flow chart actually just describes, this is the, the best representation I can give you of the model, it literally describes the decision process for the farmer trying to get grain into the system. It describes the decision process of the elevator trying to understand when am I full, and when I'm full, I can't accept any more grain, and it might be that as I do that, and this is how the model, one of the, the interaction between the railways and the, uh, and the elevator system is the following. Elevator fills up, ideal world, elevator fills up, car spot comes in, elevator unloads grain, train goes out. What we're looking for in the model, and in fact, um, Russell labored over this a long time, the arrival rates for the trains in the model are random. They're distributed less than somewhat uniformly, but they're random. But we find the model actually matches real data pretty well. We were trying to figure out whether there's some kind of arrival process we can model in there. We didn't come up with anything better than, than pure, you know, sort of uniform randomness. So essentially what's happening here, the, 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 the farmers get their grain, try to deliver it, if the elevator's not full, they deliver it. If the elevator's full, they back away and store it and move it for later. And at some point while all this is happening, a grain train shows up with a bunch of cars in it, 25, 50, or 100 car spots is what we had at the time, and unloads it. So ideally, what the elevator wants, and this happens in the vast majority of cases, even in the model, the elevator fills up part way, a, drain, a grain train comes in, and enough goes out to empty out. And the whole process just goes on smoothly. What we're looking for here are those situations where either a train arrives in an empty elevator, which can happen, or a train arrives in an elevator that's full, or an elevator is full and no train arrives. That's the worst situation, right? That's the situation where people are losing money because the, the, the grain is not moving through the system smoothly, okay? So again, stepping back, very stylized, very uh, small scale model, which is why it took so long to develop it. Um, that, I understand fully, may be a barrier <laughs> to its broader dissemination within the sector, but as you're gonna see, we get some really interesting results that kind of relate to the whole idea of contestability in the system, okay? So this is one of the validation graphs, and this may not look so close, actually. We have the simulated in red and the actual in blue, but it's actually not bad, and the reason it's a little off is because Russell actually, by doing random arrivals on the train side, he tried to avoid congestion. And it turns out in the real world, the, the railways are very good about saying, okay, if someone says, hey, wait a minute, I got a full grain elevator, they'll get a train out there. In this model, arrivals are random and the train might not come when you want it. So that again, we realize that's part of the, the issue here, but you're gonna see even under these conditions, we don't get a lot of these, um, uh, what we'll call exploitable opportunities occurring. Okay, so this is almost from the rails perspective, what we're gonna show here is almost like a worst case scenario, right? And I'll explain that a bit more as I go through. I'll be quick here. So here's the rail map of Saskatchewan that we used. Um, 
the trunk lines basically are here and here. Many of these are now short lines, especially down here towards Maple Creek. Um, the short line operators have fairly good relationships with the mainline railways, but again, we use the whole system to try to say, okay, we'll see what the whole thing looks like. And you can imagine, and what we're gonna find, these, these foregone opportunities for moving grain occur in really obscure parts of the network, and that's exactly what you think. This is why the railways want to get rid of them, why they want to ban them. We find that coming out of this, okay? So there, there are a bunch of things out of here which kind of make a whole lot of sense, actually. There's the elevator locations and processors in Saskatchewan. The reason the province isn't square there is because the upper half is all Canadian Shield. It's not farmable. So it's only the bottom half of the province, which is still pretty extensive, which is farmable. Okay, you can't really see it here. That's a screenshot of the initialized model. So here we have a rather you know, choppy, but this is all smoothed out in the model. We have all the rail lines, all these little gray dots. That's 25,472 gray dots. Those are all the farmers. And we have elevator agents in there, 157 of them. And we have train agents. We have two train agents moving trains over the tracks that we see here. So we have CP lines are the red and the CN lines are the blue, okay? So we go and run that model. What do we get? So that penalty process I told you where um, grain, the elevator is full and wants to unload. Farmers are coming to the elevator and saying, oh my God, I want to load my grain, but the elevator is full. It doesn't happen very often. It's about one in five of any given time and location we found out. The car spot that would relieve that kind of um, grain in the elevator, that would take out the grain in the elevator, in most cases is not very big. 25 car spot, about 20% of those misses were, were um, 25. About 50 car spots were about 1.25%. And the 100 car spot was very, very small. So, very rarely, even in the stylized model, do we get so much grain in a major elevator sitting there that doesn't get moved. It only happens very, very infrequently, okay? Now, from this, think about the access system. So if I am a third-party railway and I have to have perfect information in our model, and we do because we're running a model. So when one of these delivery occurrences or delivery delays occurs, we're assuming that a little light goes off on a board somewhere in Winnipeg, let's say, and someone says, there's grain available here. Get a train out there. Boom, take it, okay? So perfect, a perfect access regime. So again, worst case scenario, okay, for the railways in the sense that can a real entrant really have that much information all the time? No, but again, because the model's stylized, we're literally trying to say, at what level would, uh, would a perfect competitor, a perfectly contestable competitor, be able to get in and take this, this grain, okay? So, we generate about 8%, about 1 million tons of grain on about 13 to 15 million tons a year that is not moved through the system, I say delayed, I should have put here, not moved through the system in a timely manner, okay? Not surprisingly, the, the delayed grain tonnage appears in clusters on the provincial landscape, and Russell had a hard time representing this, but here's what he came up with. This is like kind of a density diagram so we look at uh, where we get light density, where we get heavier density problems, it's darker. So you can see way down here in Maple Creek where you got double back, you get darker. Darker means you're more likely to have delays in moving grain. In the high throughputs on the main line trunk lines of the railways, you see there are no delays. So that kind of gives you a sense. This is how much data we had, right? When again, um, I don't, we haven't even touched the surface of the data we generate on the simulation. But basically, each one of these you know, shading areas are you know, essentially a data point in the simulation. So we get this map where we can say, here, if you were, had a, a, a regulator who came out and said, okay, third party railway, if you're gonna pick up grain, you wanna focus on, you know, this is, um, that's near Swift Current, and you wanna focus on some of the major trunk lines, okay, and that's what we came up with. And a little bit beyond that, we did a very simple break even analysis of the data, and we found the following, uh, and it's in the paper, and I won't give you the exact numbers because they're, they're quite simple, Reveal that a single entrant would earn a slightly negative return on investment. So even under all these conditions where we know where these delays occur, the entrant knows, the entrant can get a car, get an engine to move and take that grain, the single entrant still gonna earn negative return on investment given the rates that are in place that year, 2006. And in fact, it runs for many years. So what rate would you need to get the entrant to come in? About 20% higher. So let me give you an example. So from Regina or Regina, Saskatchewan to Vancouver, it's about $46 a ton right now to move grain. 
which by the way, equivalently is a lot less in the US, but we know their differences, 46 bucks a ton. So we're looking at, to induce an enter to come in to take that under these perfect conditions, we'd have to be about 20% higher, so about 60 bucks a ton. So, as much as the railways may not be happy that I've kind of opened the Pandora's box of the access issue here, I guarantee you the shippers aren't happy with me because I can tell them the rates you're gonna get under a fully contestable system with no other regulations are gonna be higher than currently exist. Part of the reason the rates are gonna be that much higher, we think, is because, don't forget, all these rates are regulated. So they're already artificially lower anyway, essentially. That's kind of my take on this stuff, so. All right, very good, and I think I hit time right on, yeah, okay. Um, questions, comments? And I apologize for going through a lot of stuff very quickly, like many of us have had to do. Yeah. I'll let, I'll let uh, Jeff pick who's gonna go. Hi, I'm uh, Ted Kalick from CN. Hi. Uh, question for you. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing fine. No, no, I know uh, there are a few of you folks here, that's good. Um, in terms of how far the study went, do you take into account supply chain issues that may impact the ability of the third party to access, i.e., if there are bottlenecks at the port in Vancouver, right. and the, the terminal can't unload cars fast enough and send the empties back, or the ships aren't coming in on time? Excellent questions. Russell, we talked about that, Russell, in the thesis, in the paper that I've written, that's a great question, the paper I've written, I've kind of moved a little bit of that to the side, but in the thesis he did, he tried to account for that. So for example, I don't think Vancouver ever bottles up, but as we both know it does, and again, with the volumes that we had here in the data, at about 15 million tons, we don't get bottlenecks too, too often with that, but the other issues he has, he really tried to avoid congesting the system, and that may be unrealistic in some sense, right? But again, these were lower grain volumes as well, so. That's a good question, actually. Yes? Uh, James, two questions. Uh, one is, you gave an entire presentation on grain and grain regulations, and you never once mentioned the phrase crow's nest pass. <laughs> now, my question is, is that something we need to worry about anymore, or should we ignore it? You mean in terms of the rate structure? Yes, and the fact that it existed. <laughs> right. Okay, and those of you that you probably all know, of course, there was a long-term regime in Canada of heavily, heavily subsidized grain rates, okay? Up until 1984, I think it was, with WGTA, 87, I'm sorry, that regime changed and became a purely distance-based subsidy, and then that regime changed in 99-2000 with the revenue cap, or the maximum revenue entitlement. Um, my person, this is my personal opinion only, and I'll, I'll, my, my caveat here is all opinions here are my own, in fact. Uh, my personal opinion here is that that regime is passe, it's gone, we don't need to go there. My own feeling is, in spite of how grain shippers might feel about this, um, I, I don't want necessarily an access regime. I would like to induce contestability in the market and let it fall where it may at that point. And I think that that's the paradigm we have to keep thinking about. The grain shippers want MRE, they probably want crow regulation, I've heard that talked about too, and no, that's not, that's not where we're gonna go. Um, honestly, the grain shippers I've talked to, the grain companies, they, they're not really wanting it either. It's the farmers who feel kind of left out in this whole process, and of course there's some call from farm organizations to do this, but it's not going to happen, nor do I think it should actually. So second question. Second question. Um, about 20 years ago, maybe longer, the Canadian government bought, I don't know, tens of thousands of Rail beautiful cars. orange and uh, yeah, yeah. yellow cars. Uh, covered hopper cars yeah. that said Government of Canada. Yeah. Um, does that fleet of government-owned cars still exist? Uh, were the cars allocated to the two major railroads? Uh, Please correct me if I'm wrong in saying this. They're getting very old. They're, uh, yeah, they're rusting now. They're right? rusting. Um, you know, there's, I, the hopper car fleet is an issue I've kind of moved, I kept away from because I honestly think the market will hopefully sort that out, but you're right. There are a bunch of these cars left over. I know CN and CP own several hundred to a couple thousand of their own cars that, that are obviously the best in the fleet, probably, uh, and the old ones you need replacing. And yes, there is controversy about how that's going to happen and where that money's gonna come from. That's a great question, and I do not know where that's gonna come from. So. Question? Hi, I'm yeah, Deb ahead. Miller with the Surface Transportation Board, and I'm sorry to say I missed your entire presentation. Well, so. there you go. <laughs> and so asking I, so this I will, question. So I will not talk to it. No, I'm kidding. I, <laughs> right? Uh, no, but when I came, you were, you were just... 
uh, in your concluding and in response to a question, you, I thought what you said is that your preference is to induce contestable markets? Yes. So how does one do that? Like That's what the whole paper was about. <laughs> Sorry. Is that, I mean, I'm a lie when I say that. Um, how do we do it? Well, the, the current way is done. You don't yeah, have to no, drag no, no. everybody through it if you really did. No, no, I can, we, we I can follow up with you. We talked a little bit about the inter-switching regulations that are currently in place in Canada, which, which, by the way, were based somewhat on the research I did several years ago that was published in a journal. Um, the inter-switching regulations seem to be working. I don't mind them. It's up to the railways, I think, to figure out how much they hate them and kind of decide on that point. I'm not advocating open access. This was an experiment to see exactly under what conditions access in grain handling, which supposedly is an industry that could benefit from this according to theory, uh, and, it, and it does, but you don't get the rates you'd think. So if we have $50 rates in Canada for grain from let's say the middle of the prairies, and you have, let's say if you average out the cotton and everything else, about 80 to $85 rates from Montana, North Dakota, guess what? Under this regime, we fall somewhere right in the middle, basically. So farmers aren't going to be happy because if you had open access, if you completely removed regulation and said, the only regulation we're going to have is kind of devil in the details, like what Hunter Harrison proposed for the merger was to have some kind of open access regime. Even in grain, you'd get higher rates. And the farmers aren't going to like to hear that. And they don't like to hear it. But this is what the model bore out. Honestly, when I did this, I honestly thought we'd get rates that were at that level or a bit lower. I really did, but that's not what showed up. So as a scientist, I have to report to you that, in fact, we're somewhere in the middle, and I think I know why, because of the nature of the contestability in the market. So we're not going to get marginal cost pricing. Can't. Farmers don't get that, but we all know they don't get that. So I'm not dissing farmers. They just don't understand rail economics, typically, right? And that's part of what I try to do is educate them on this as well, right, which doesn't go over very well, typically. So. Other questions? All right. Okay. Thanks, Thank you very much. Thanks.